Hi everyone, welcome back to the very last, last lecture of Useful Genetics. This is a special lecture about the new gene editing technique called CRISPR, or more formally CRISPR-Cas9. We'll talk about its original function in bacteria, how it's been modified by researchers to provide new techniques for gene editing in plants and animals, we'll talk about all the advantages of this new technique, and the ways we can use it, and some of the problems we still have in using it. Now, the original function of CRISPR-Cas9 systems was to destroy the DNA of bacterial viruses. Here we have a drawing of a bacterial virus injecting its DNA. The DNA multiplies and will produce more virus, except that the cell has weapons in its cell. It has guide RNAs, small RNAs, that are, have evolved to have base sequence identity to different DNA viruses and a gene called Cas9, which produces a nuclease that can cut DNA. If the guide RNA encounters a virus it can base pair with, it recruits the Cas9 nuclease to that virus DNA, and the nuclease cuts the DNA. Other copies of the nuclease molecule can cut the DNA throughout the cell, thereby preventing the virus from infecting the cell. Now, this has been modified in several ways. I'll start with the simplest, which is directly delivering the CRISPR components into a cell. Here's a plant or animal cell and a chromosome that we wish to change. We inject into the cell a mixture of the guide RNA, the Cas nuclease, and a correction DNA. The guide RNA has been engineered to base pair right at the site that we want to change. It again recruits the Cas9 nuclease, which cuts the DNA, leaving a gap, a double-strand gap in the DNA, which will be lethal unless it's fixed. It's fixed by the correction DNA, which has been engineered to be identical in sequence on its flanking regions to the sequence of the target chromosome and have a new sequence at the site of the cut. Because the sequences are identical, it can recombine with the target chromosome in a process called recombinational repair. Now, this technique is very simple to describe, but it's actually a bit of a pain to do because you have to purify the RNA, which is very fussy, and purify the protein. A simpler technique lets the cell do more of the work by instead injecting into the cell a plasmid that contains genes like the bacterial chromosome, genes for the Cas9 nuclease and the guide RNA, also injecting the correction DNA. The cell then does the work of producing the guide RNA and the Cas nuclease. As before, the guide RNA binds to the chromosome, the Cas nuclease makes a cut, and the correction DNA repairs it by recombinational repair. An even more elegant system does away with the separate um, correction DNA by having the plasmid itself also take on the function of the correction DNA. So again, the plasmid encodes for the guide RNA and the Cas nuclease. These target the precise position in the DNA and cut it. And now the plasmid itself is going to serve as the correction DNA. Because the plasmid has been engineered to have sequences identical to the sequences flanking the cut site, it can itself be the substrate for recombinational repair. The result is that the Cas9 gene and the guide RNA gene are now in the chromosome at the site of the cut. This is elegantly simple, but it has a much more important advantage. And that is because until now, I've been describing a single chromosome as if we were talking about haploid cells. But in reality, most of the changes that we would want to make would be in diploid cells. Sometimes it will be sufficient to change one copy of the gene, but on many occasions it's desirable to be able to change both copies. The advantage of this self-propagating system is that once the guide RNA and, CRISP and Cas9 nuclease genes are in the chromosome, they can produce the molecules, which can then act on the homologous chromosome, cutting it. And now the original chromosome serves as the template for recombinational repair. Now both chromosomes have the Cas9 and guide RNA sequences in them. Now, 
what can we do? Why is this a lot better than the old system? Well, one very important feature is that it is much more precise. And it's precise for the same reason that we talked about precision in meiotic recombination. It's guided by base pairing at two stages. Base pairing between the guide RNA and the target chromosome precisely directs cast nuclease to a specific place. And second, base pairing between the correction DNA and the target chromosome makes sure that the change is inserted at the right place. It's also very efficient. It turns out that the guide RNA and the Cas9 nuclease are very robust. They're not fussy about the environment that they're in. And this means that it's very simple to have them work. You don't have to spend you know, years of research or time fiddling with the conditions to get things right. It's simple enough, in fact, that you can now buy, for a few hundred dollars, you can buy a kit to do CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. It's also not fussy about the organism that it's in. Not only does it work in a wide range of bacteria, it also works in a wide range of plants and animals. Rice, tomato, corn, um, many kinds of livestock, insects, experimental animals. So it is very, very versatile. It's also able to make more than one change in a single experiment by using multiple guide RNAs and um, correction DNAs in, it provided to a single cell, it's possible to change multiple genes in one offspring. By providing multiple correction DNAs, but all the same guide RNA, it's possible to make many different changes in the same gene. Now, how can we use this system? Well, I have to emphasize that what I'm about to describe is mostly um, changes that are at the proof of principle stage. We know these things will work. They have been tested in the particular organism cells, but usually at this stage, they've only been done in cultured cells. Most of them have not been done to produce the organisms yet, not the livestock ones, for instance, and certainly not the human ones. So we can use the CRISPR-Cas9 system to create new crops and new varieties of livestock. We can modify existing genes. We can insert new genes. We can insert genes for proteins that are particularly useful to us. It's a kind of process often called molecular farming. We're using a crop simply to produce a particular protein that we want. One nice example of this, although it wasn't done using CRISPR, I don't think, is that the antibodies that were used to treat Ebola patients in the recent epidemic were produced in tobacco. One particularly elegant use, I think, is to turn the system back to its original function and use a CRISPR-engineered system to provide plants and animals with resistance to viruses. In this case, we need only provide the organism with the Cas nuclease and the guide RNA. We don't need a correction DNA at all because the target of the guide RNA is a virus whose DNA we want to destroy. Another use is specific for the self-propagating system that I described. When I described it a few slides earlier, I stopped at the point where we had converted both homologous chromosomes to containing the Cas nuclease and the guide RNA genes. But we don't need to stop there. If we can think about the next generation, when this individual matures and mates, it will mate with an uh, individual who has only normal chromosomes. But their offspring will be heterozygous. And just as in the previous example, one copy of the modified gene is able to convert the other, so their offspring will become homozygous. And their offspring, initially heterozygous, will become homozygous. This is a very fast way for a gene to spread through a population, um, much faster than the, um, say, spread of transgenes that we worry about with GMO systems. This can be a very beneficial thing. It's very recently been used to prevent the spread of malaria by creating a self-propagating CRISPR system 
that confers resistance to malaria, not onto people, but onto mos the mosquitoes that spread malaria. So the transgene that makes the mosquitoes resistant to malaria is spread rapidly through a mosquito population. That mosquito population can no longer transmit malaria to people. This is great, but it's also a very concerning thing because this system could spread any transgene through a population. And certainly, if the transgene was harmful, it could spread even though it caused a decrease in fitness. Now, one very important use of CRISPR transgene systems is getting a lot of attention right now, and that is we can use this system to improve our ability to use animal organs for human transplants. Now, you know that there are many situations when people need organ transplants. Um, people with kidney damage need kidney transplants. They may be on dialysis for years. People with cystic fibrosis often will die unless they can get a lung transplant. But there's never enough organs available for transplant. So one very important research area is developing our ability to use animal organs in place of human organs in transplants. The most popular candidate for this is the pig because pigs grow as large as humans and much of their biology is very similar. But one important problem, among others, is that the pig genome contains 62 endogenous retroviruses. You remember retroviruses are like retrotransposons, except they can come out of cells and infect other cells. So there's great concern that if we were to use these pig organs for transplant, that these retroviruses could reactivate and infect the new human recipient. Um, researchers recently were able to use CRISPR-Cas9 to inactivate all 62 of these endogenous retroviruses, creating pig cells that no longer pose this risk. One very tempting and likely very soon to come use of CRISPR-Cas9 technology is for somatic gene therapy in humans. Not changing the germline, but changing some of the body tissues so that they are now correcting a metabolic problem. Um, we know that we can correct hemoglobin mutations in human stem cells. We can probably use CRISPR to correct hemophilia mutations in human liver cells so that they produce clotting factors. We know we can modify immune system cells to attack new targets. Perhaps we can modify them to attack the cells of a specific tumor. And with luck, to have something that is relatively insensitive to the mutations that the tumor might undergo. Now, what about germline corrections? First, I'll describe the more attractive possibility that we could use CRISPR-Cas9 to correct in the germline serious human mutations. We've talked about this in Module 6 when we talked about personal genomics, that if both parents are heterozygous for a harmful mutation, 25% risk that an embryo will be homozygous. If one parent is heterozygous for an allele that's harmful when it's heterozygous, there's a 50% risk, or if it's an excellent allele, there's a 50% risk. In principle, we can use CRISPR-Cas9 directly injecting into the embryo to correct the allele. But we don't really need to do this because we already have, as we described in Lecture 6D, we have pre-implantation genetic screening, which can screen the embryos and identify those embryos that have the desired wild-type genotype and only implant those. The place where germline correction might be really valuable is in the much more rare situations when both parents are homozygous for a harmful allele. This might be the case for um, alleles such as severe deafness, or there are many severe phenotypes which people can survive. They're not lethal, but they're extremely unpleasant and undesirable. And for those, many parents would welcome the opportunity to be able to have a baby that did not have the mutation that both parents had. Now, people dream about also using systems like CRISPR-Cas9 to carry out germline alterations to improve normal phenotypes, the real designer baby ideas. And this raises a lot of 
deeply complex ethical issues, which I'm not going to talk about here because I'm not an ethicist. I don't really have any expertise to bring to these issues. But what I will talk about is the much more immediate reason not to carry out the human experiments, and that is that there's still a lot that can go wrong. One kind of going wrong is that I've described this wonderful new process. It's precise, it's efficient, it still makes mistakes. When mistakes happen, outcomes are wrong in a plant or animal system, we're quite happy to simply discard the ones that didn't work and, if necessary, try again. We can't do that in a human system. We need it to work first time perfectly. And it's far from doing that at this point. Um, the Cas nuclease, the guide RNAs can be engineered to go precisely where they're supposed to. Cas9 nuclease, unfortunately, still sometimes cuts in the wrong places. This creates double strand breaks that can be lethal to the cell, or they can be the substrates for various kinds of DNA repair that create a lot of unwanted chromosome rearrangements and dysfunctional chromosomes. Um, a bigger concern that reflects a deeper um, lack of understanding in, in our biology, how little we really know about how genes work, is that, as you know, most genes affect many phenotypes. When we think about gene editing to correct a serious medical defect, we're thinking about one gene, one phenotype, perhaps something like the cystic fibrosis mutation that causes cystic fibrosis. We can be pretty confident that if we change the single mutation in the CF gene, we'll restore the phenotype. But most genes aren't like that. Most genes affect many phenotypes to greater or lesser degrees. And most phenotypes that we would like to change are affected by many different genes. And we are still very ignorant about how these processes work. All the details of which genes affect what and how they do it, we don't know nearly enough to risk making changes in humans. So that's the end of the last lecture, what we've done. We've talked about how CRISPR-Cas9 works, what bacteria do it, do with it, and how we've modified it. We've talked about what we can do with it, about the ethical issues, and that what can go wrong. Now, there's no next lecture to hope to see you there at, so I'm going to leave you with an XKCD cartoon, like the cartoons that we started with. I chose this cartoon because it lays out how much we really still have to learn about how genes work.